Today on Larry King Now, our panel on being transgender in America. How has the media represented the trans community? Kind of a fixation on trans people's bodies is both objectifying and also distracts us away from talking about the real issues that trans people face. Our panel will share their personal stories. I used to say what a family is. I, I, I get that I maybe don't have an, a conventional family, but that doesn't mean it's any less of a family or any less of a positive environment to bring my daughter up in. Plus, you can still be fired in 32 states simply for being transgender. So 60% of Americans currently live somewhere in the United States where if they simply say I'm transgender, the boss can say you're fired and that's it. It's all next on Larry King Now. Welcome to Larry King Now. We expect a very important discussion today. In recent years, the United States has seen a remarkable and rapid sea change in public opinion when it comes to equal rights for the gay community, specifically in terms of gay marriage, and the courts and state legislators have been relatively quick to follow suit. However, the transgender community has yet to see the same level of progress. Today, our panel will discuss what needs to be done to ensure a better quality of life for this long discriminated segment of the society. Alex Newell is an actor and singer who is best known for his role as a transgender teen on Fox's hit series Glee. Nick Adams is the director of the communications and special projects for GLAAD, an organization that has been at the forefront of promoting equality for the LGBT community. And Laura Jane Grace is best known as the lead singer of the punk rock band Against Me. And she's the host of the new AOL original series, True Trans with Laura Jane Grace. We thank them all uh, for coming. Uh, when this role was offered to you, what did you think of it? Honestly, I just read the script. I really didn't know what was going on because it wasn't, it wasn't forced. As soon as I figured out what was going on, I went out and I started reading and I started talking to people in the community that were trans. But our objective here is to educate people, even myself. For many, it's a confusing po topic I want to speak about. It. Have we come a long way? You know, it's funny, it took me a very long time to figure out that I was transgender because there were these media stories about transgender women like Renee Richards, but I never saw a media story about a transgender man, someone like me, until I was 33 years old. So for me, you know, um, there's still a tremendous amount of invisibility when it comes to dealing with transgender men in the media. So uh, in my work at GLAAD, we try to encourage shows to tell that story as well. Are there statistics? Are there more transgender women? I think it's hard to tell um, because it's very difficult to count how many transgender people there are. I think historically people thought there were more transgender women than there are transgender men, but as the internet has come along and many more trans people are coming out, we're seeing that become much more equal. Uh, there are certain rules, there are certain things that transgenders don't like to talk about. Am I correct, Laura Jane? Um, I mean, I, I think there's certain way to phrase questions and there's certain <laughs> ways to, to talk about things, you know, but sometimes people's approach oftentimes can be done the wrong way. All right, let me, uh, per personal <laughs> nature, I was never interested in the sexual angle and all that kind of thing. But, well, I was, but that's an important distinction because it's not a sex thing, it's a gender thing. And sexuality and gender are two totally different things. But I was always interested in what was it like when you uh, were the other sex to be in a, the body you didn't belong in? What was that like psychologically? Um, well, it's, it's kind of different than that, you know, because my body is my body. I've always had my body. I've never felt any different. I've just known that there's been a misalignment with the way people perceive me based on the way I perceive myself. And, and certain things may be hormonally that I would have liked to have corrected, you know, but as far as like, it doesn't mean you're like all of a sudden this different person when you say you're trans or no, you're transitioning. Did you, feel, did you, know? you feel awkward? Um, well, I felt like pressure oftentimes, which is where the dysphoria would come in, especially being in the roles where I was placed in, being in a, in a, in a band, being this male singer, where you're supposed to fit this archetype of like, fit this role, be, be, this, be this dude, and that wasn't me. So when you're forced to fit into a gender role, that creates extreme dysphoria, and oftentimes it leads to the breaking point. You know? What does the word dysphoria mean? 
It's a word used um, by psychologists to describe basically the disconnect between, um, or the incongruence between how you feel on the inside, which is gender identity, and the body that you were born with. So that incongruence, they call it dysphoria. Um, some trans people use that word to describe it, some people don't, but it's basically that you know, disconnect between everybody looks at this body and thinks I'm one thing, but I know on the inside that my heart, my soul, and my personhood basically is something different. All right, what's the wrong terminology? Is um, there wrong terminology? Well, I, you know, I think what you got to realize is that oftentimes it's, it's more about you or the other person than it is the trans person because you're trying to give somebody a way for them to define you, to understand you. Because when it comes down to it, me, I'm just a person, you're just a person, we're all just people. Right. You know, so saying someone is trans, you just gotta think, what's the best way to define them? What would I feel most comfortable saying in front of them? You know, you wouldn't feel comfortable calling me a tranny. You feel might be more comfortable calling me trans, right? And trans is just good, like, blanket terminology, I think. You like trans. I think it sounds cool, so <laughs> that helps, you know? And I also think, like, and, Right at the beginning of this Sounds interview, like transportation, <laughs> right which in the sense it is. Right, yeah. yeah. You're always on the move. Uh, right at the beginning of this interview, the, I think there's a good example. I, you used the word transgenders as a noun, or how did you feel about playing a transgender? And I personally, that grates on my ear a little bit when it's used as a noun. To me, it sounds like you're saying, oh, uh, you know, you're a chair or something. Like, I'm not a noun. So at GLAD, we encourage people to use transgender as an adjective, so to modify a person. So I'm a transgender man, Laura Jane's a transgender transgender woman. And he plays a trans. And he plays a transgender teenager. Right. Yeah. But it's important, important also to recognize that there are transgender people that don't necessarily identify as male or female. Sure. That there's a whole wide variance in the gender spectrum out there. You know? Right. And, so and we're going to deal with how the media doesn't understand this or mistreats it, right? Mm -hmm. Coming up with our panel, we'll share some personal stories. We'll be right back. Playing a trans. Have you learned a lot about the trans community, am I correct? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, playing this character, it's just opened my eyes and just educated on me to everything. And I think that's like a giant portion of understanding something if you're educated on it. And I feel like our society in general has a problem with understanding things, so they cast it out. And so just playing it just, it enlightens me in a sense of a different struggle because I've had my own struggles as just being a gay black man in America. And now playing this this role of finding that battle of uh, there's something that's not right on the physical outside, but on the inside there's something that is right, and I just want the uh, whole world to see that as well. And I feel like that is more of a lesson in itself. All right, what was it like for you growing up? Um, growing up, well, as I mentioned before, I saw very little, especially I grew up in a small town in Illinois, I saw very little about transgender people anywhere. So I felt like I didn't even have the language to talk about what was going on with me. So I was a tomboy, I, you know, and that's cute for little girls for a while, and then it gets to a point where it's not cute anymore. And I was just trying to figure out why do I feel so uncomfortable being a woman, you know? Um, sometimes you'll hear trans people say that they prayed from the time they were little to be a boy or something like that. I, that wasn't my experience, even though it's a common one. I just felt really uncomfortable being seen as a woman. So it took until I was in my early 30s seeing finally a transgender man for the first time to realize that that was who I really was. But what's really interesting, Larry, is that, that my story, the, the person who comes out as an adult, the person who never heard anything about trans stuff growing up, is becoming a historical oddity because of the internet. So many more people now are able to find information, resources, YouTube videos, trans youth telling their stories. So more people are starting to be able to explain who they are to their parents or their friends at much younger ages. Which what is, was I think, it like for, for them or you were a tomboy as a child? What was it like for you as a young adult? What was it like for you when you were 23? What it was like for me when I was 23 was I was confused in my own head about the difference between sexual orientation and gender identity. So I thought, well, I, <laughs> when I got to college, the women I saw that had short hair and no makeup and sensible shoes were lesbians. And I thought, well, in spite of the fact that I've always been attracted to men, maybe I'm a lesbian. So I tried that for a while. But I often say it's like wearing shoes that don't fit, like uh, they just pinched my feet, like I knew that wasn't right, but I didn't know what else it could possibly be. So once I figured it out and I realized that I actually wanted to live in the world as a man and that I was still attracted to men, that I would end up being a gay man. 
Laura Jane, what was your young life like? Um, I grew up in a military family. My father was a West Point graduate, so I moved from Army base to Army base. Um, uh, moved to South Florida when I was a teenager, and and that was really like when puberty started and everything. I started getting in a lot of trouble, and it was really when gender dysphoria really kicked in hardcore for me. Did you think you were gay? I didn't know. It, you know, I kind of came up right as the internet was becoming a thing or whatever. Uh, I just had no access to information, you know, and, and didn't really know what was going on with me. So I got into drugs and alcohol and punk rock and started a band and started touring the world. And for a while, you know, the punk scene in particular, what attracted to me, at, at, me to it and rock and roll in general was the ambiguity of the way gender roles were playing, played around with, you know. What does it feel like to finally change? It feels really liber liberating as an artist and as a performer. I had reached a point where I'd be on stage and just was like hitting a brick wall where I didn't know who I was supposed to be up there. So to be up there and to be able to just be myself is, is really freeing and, and great. You've said, Alex, that on Glee, you feel like you're playing two different characters in the same body. How do you mean? You have Wade, who has this constant struggle of just not feeling like he's being true to himself, mainly because he's not a he on the inside, he's a she. And then you have Unique, who's a strong, confident, perseverant powerhouse of a personality, person, human being, and you see the contrast of playing both of these different people and then being one being at the same time. Since the acceptance of gays have grown so quickly that it's almost mind-boggling, why hasn't it been faster for the trans community? Well, you know, um, studies have shown that 9 out of 10 Americans say they personally know someone who's gay, lesbian, or bisexual. So 90% of people have a brother or a minister or a teacher, somebody they know who's gay, lesbian, or bisexual. Only 8% of Americans say they personally know someone who's transgender. So that means that, you know, there are fewer of us, fewer people think that they have met us or know us. And so they're getting a lot of their information from the media. <laughs> and up until recently, the media has not done the best job in sort of telling the true stories of transgender people. So one of the reasons I value so much the work I do at GLAD is I get to work with the media to do a better job so that those 92% of Americans who don't think they know anybody who's transgender can get actual stories through the media and really learn more about us. One of my proudest achievements was getting an award from GLAD. What's the biggest misconception people have? For me, coming out to my friends and family, I thought that they thought that I was also saying, like, I don't actually like the type of music that I like, or I don't actually have this personality or the same sense of humor or anything like that. It's just a really small detail when it comes down to it, you know, and, and pretty inconsequential, when, really. What, what was it like for you when you, I asked her what was it like when she finally came, what was it like for you to finally come out? It was pretty um, empowering and liberating, I think, as well. You know, um, I spent 30-some years of my life being out in public and people saying, can I help you, sir, ma'am, sir, ma'am. There was all this confusion. And um, once I started to transition, um, I had the experience of just being, can I help you, sir? And that felt very right to me. And I felt like I was finally kind of being seen as my true self. Up next, our panel will discuss the media's representation of the transgender community and a lot more. Stay with us. We're back with our outstanding panel. As discrimination falls in the area of gays, is it falling in the area of trans? There's a long way to go. Um, you can still be fired in 32 states simply for being transgender. So 60% of Americans currently live somewhere in the United States where if they simply say, I'm transgender, the boss can say you're fired and that's it. Um, transgender people still cannot openly serve in the military. So don't ask, don't tell was repealed, but that only applied to gay and lesbian people. So there are many, many challenges still facing transgender people in America today, and we have a really long way to go still in terms of that discrimination being lessened. You have a daughter. I do, right? yes. Mm -hmm. As a mother, does it bother you that some in the media imply that the LGBT community goes against uh, family values? Of course. I mean, like, who's to say what a family is? I, I, I get that I maybe don't have an, a, a conventional family, but that doesn't mean it's any less of a family or any less of a positive environment to bring my daughter up in. And I think that, you know, being true to yourself and, and uh, accepting certain truths about yourself and being open with that is setting an example to a child that is, is something really important for their, their happiness later on in life. I didn't see either show, but I'm told that Katie Couric had a transgender woman on her show and made some gaffes. 
and Pierce Morgan did the same when he had on Janet Mock. What were the what was the hullabaloo about? Mm -hmm. And did they ever apologize? Katie Couric did a wonderful um, job, actually. A few months later, she did a follow-up show, invited some trans folks onto her show to talk about the violence and the discrimination and the poverty facing the community. So she really kind of did a great job of kind of te having that be a teachable moment. And um, what she did that was the gaffe was simply look at a transgender woman and ask her what her genitals looks like, which it's not really appropriate, <laughs> you know. Um, I would say. So, uh, but that is a very common question that the media has been asking trans people since Christine Jorgensen got off the plane in 1952. I knew Christine. So, I, uh, I wish old. I had. <laughs> I knew Christine um, very well. I had her on quite a few times. And this fixation, um, as Laverne Cox said so eloquently to Katie Couric when she did that, was this kind of a fixation on trans people's bodies is both objectifying and also distracts us away from talking about the real issues that trans people face. And what did Pierce do wrong? Oh, um, he an interviewed Janet Mock, and through much of the interview, referred to her as being, you know, born a boy, lived as a boy, was so pretty, can't really tell you're a boy. There was a kind of an, uh, uh, an essence of kind of putting a story on her as opposed to letting her tell her own story. And Janet's story is that she transitioned really quite young as a teenager. Uh, Alex, last year Bill O'Reilly said this about your character. If you make it glamorous in a program like Glee, which is undeniably a good program, a lot of these dopey kids are going to be confused about who they are. What did you make of that? You know, when I heard that, I was just like, one, it's rude to call kids dopey because as growing up in general, you want to find yourself and that's your time to find yourself so that when you're an adult, you can be out, you can be proud. And this for my show, not my show, but the show that I'm on, Glee, it's we do everything flashy because we sing, we dance, we act. So inevitably, everything's going to be singing, dancing, and acting all the time. And so it's not in a glamorous light because my character is just there. It's, she's just there, and she's living her life as a normal teenager who is at the same time trans. And so him saying that was just kind of off-putting. Can I add to that? I yes. Think that's sure. so important. Anybody though, can like, jump in. Is having those role models in TV because it does send a positive message for anyone out there who's struggling with gender identity of like, oh, y it's cool. Yeah. Like, you know, oh, you can be successful and you can have, like, be an artist or you could be anything you want. Absolutely. And then teaches, you know, teaches tolerance to other people who may not be genderqueer or struggling with that in any way, but just to see that represented that there are people of all types. In exactly. The world. I'm told uh, Laverne Cox from Orange is the New Black is beloved by many and has created awareness, but her character is still in prison. Is the trans community often the criminal or the victim on TV? Yeah, I think with Orange is the New Black, you, you actually get a sense of that character as a full person, though, and, and it's true she's in prison, but she's a multidimensional character. But what I usually see on television and what I'm glad we've done a study looking at is the fact that typically trans characters on, like, scripted television are either the murder victim or the psychotic killer or the most common profession shown by tr of trans characters having in television is sex worker. So it's a very um, negative, stereotypical, defamatory portrayal of trans people that typically appears on scripted television. Shows like Orange is the New Black and Transparent and Glee are making huge step forwards in terms of showing, you know, just real people. In fact, uh, let's show a clip of Alex on Glee and we'll get your reaction. What do you, how do you react to that? I think it's great. You know, that's a, a reality. It's like, a, it's kind of a stupid reality that it's even an issue anyone has to deal with, but it's a, that's real, you know? What did you think, Nick? Yeah, I thought it was a whole episode that was really interesting about the challenges trans students in school have with locker rooms and sports teams and bathrooms. And New York Magazine has this woman on the cover, the highest paid female CEO in America used to be a man. What'd you make of this? I, I don't like it, personally. Because. Just because it sensationalizes it. Because it, I don't know, that's, it's just the highest paid CEO is the story, you know? Like, and there, the, the merits that that person has, you know, have nothing to do with gender. But couldn't I look at that as a pro statement for the trans community saying, wait a minute, the highest paid woman in America is a trans? 
and you but tell me. But it doesn't me, say that. It says no. he used to be a man. So <laughs> yeah, sure, say the highest paid CEO in America is trans. Right. That's fine. Sure. So there's a difference but, between the headline, which is very kind of exploitative, I think, used to be a man, phraseology, and the story itself, which shows that you can be transgender, you can be successful. And also, so the trans community has an unemployment rate double the general population. And for trans people of color, their unemployment rate is four times the general population. So there's clearly employment challenges that trans people face. But if you look at people like Martine or Amanda Simpson, who works in the Department of Defense, or any other like successful trans women, we also need those stories to show that you can be successful if given a chance, and people would you know give you that opportunity. Can transgender folk join the military? No, they cannot. Um, the Palm Center estimates there's 15,000 trans people serving in the military right now who can't be out about it. If I could tell you a real quick story from the show True Trans that I'm doing at the AOL, one of the people that I interviewed is an activist organizer from San Diego named Blue Montana, who was a Marine for 13 years. And Blue's job was receiving the bodies back from Iraq and Afghanistan, making sure they were dressed and had all their medals and everything like that. When Blue came out, they were discharged from the military dishonorably, now owe hundreds of thousands of dollars back to the military. And the, the service that they were performing for their country and for their nation, I mean, that, you know, their gender had nothing to do with that. So being treated like that and hearing stories like that is just, Unbelievable. you know, that. And when our example. ally countries like Canada, England, Israel, I mean, there are many Western countries that allow trans people to serve. There's no reason why they can't serve here as well. Next, our panel will answer some of your questions from the social media aspect. Don't go away. back with Alex Newell, Nick Adams, and Laura Jane Grace. And we have some social media questions. At Bad Lemon 4 on Twitter, Laura, if you had a message to uh, a cisgender people in society regarding transgender folk, what would the message be? Um, I think that it's that it's okay to ask questions and it's okay to not be totally educated, but that there's a way to do that, you know? And taking someone aside and just being blunt and saying like, what pronouns would you like for me to use? You know, how do you identify? How would you like to be treated? Is a really simple thing that you can do that is just easy. And if you're unsure of somebody's gender, you don't have to use it in a sentence. You know, you can say they, them, or there. You can just not, not make it gender specific. That's the goal. I think it, you know, it would make a lot of things way easier for a lot of people. Kelsey Anderson on Twitter wants to know, Alex, will you be back on Glee, Glee this season? Oh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. You just have to find out. <laughs> <laughs> you can't say it. We run a tight ship over mm -hmm. there. <laughs> okay, Alex. <laughs> Uh, via hate nine nineteen eighty seven and Laura has the punk scene been supportive of your transition? Did you say via hate nineteen seventy seven was the name? Has the punk scene been su supportive? Very much so. Yeah, very much so. In a humbling way. Stephanie McCarthy on Twitter. How has the LGB community accepted the trans community? Um. I think very well. I mean, first of all, it's not entirely separate. I'm gay and trans, so there's overlap. And um. You know, I think there is some confusion sometimes because the LGB is about sexual orientation, right? So it's kind of who are you attracted to, who do you want to marry, who do you want to go to bed with? And the T is about who am I? And that's kind of confuses people sometimes that they're put together, but I think it's for a good reason because a lot of times people hate us for the same reasons, you know? And um, so I think the LGB community has been largely, well, certainly they're my strongest allies when it comes to... You ever wonder why you hated for something that you had no control over? <laughs> All, <laughs> every day. And that affects really no that, one else, to be that, honest. That boggles my mind. Right. No one thinks you chose this. Right, yeah. Right? Uh-huh. No. I mean, I, I, although I would, I would choose it. <laughs> I would choose it. Just so you you know. would? Yeah, uh-huh. And even if you did choose it, what difference What's does it, it make, yeah. you know? Alexandro on Twitter. What is it like for trans people in rural areas of the country as compared to big cities? Well, I think that it's a lot easier because of the internet and they can find connections through that. But it certainly can be very challenging. I mean, one of the things, if you're going to take hormones and you know change your body as a trans person, you need to have competent medical care. And doctors aren't trained on this in medical schools and a lot of them will just refuse to treat a trans person. Are so if you live in rural there, areas, you need to go somewhere you know, where you can find competent medical care. Are there specialist care. doctors who deal with it? 
Um, well, I mean, you know, exactly what you're saying, where, like, when I started transitioning, it was in Florida. I had one option for a, a gender therapist and one option for an endocrinologist. And in Florida, I had to go to psychotherapy for X amount of months before I'd be prescribed, but before I'd be given a letter to refer to me to an endocrinologist who still had a say as to whether or not I could that get access. Law. Right. Whereas in Chicago, where I live now, it's informed consent, and I can walk into a doctor and I can say, this is what I'm doing. Help me, you know? Yeah. Nick, what kind of resources and support systems support system is out there for the transgender community? Well, we certainly, um, I keep harping on the internet, but it's partly because for many years doctors told trans people that in order to be successful you had to transition and then never tell anyone you were trans and make up stories about your childhood and say I was in Cub Scouts and all that kind of stuff and that was considered a successful transition and many trans people did that and never talked to another trans person about their shared experience. That's changed a lot since I came out 15 years ago and now trans people are finding each other online, meeting in person, gathering together you know in groups and organizing so there are resources in the larger cities. I think if you live in rural Nebraska it's a lot more challenging. What are, what are a few of the main things that need to happen to ensure equality for the trans community? What needs to happen? Protection in the work, work, workplace, access to health care. Um, you know, what else? Come on, help me out. Well, you don't have access to health care? <laughs> well, just making sure that people aren't denied access to health care and getting health insurance to help with some transition stuff, you know, that is... Is, is integral for some most health insurance policies have a trans exclusion clause which says specifically they won't talk they won't cover anything related to trans gender transition they consider it cosmetic which is not what the American Medical Association cosmetic? says yeah the American Medical Association says it's medically necessary and insurance companies treat it as cosmetic so there's definitely a lot of work that needs to be done with health care but one thing that hasn't been mentioned that's really actually a huge problem for the community and part of this education and talking to people out there is to to help them understand that we're people, is the epidemic of violence faced by trans people is ridiculous, especially really? trans women of color. So since June, 10 transgender women of color have been murdered in hate crimes in this country. And that's not unusual. Every year in November, we have Transgender Day of Remembrance to read the names of the trans people who've been killed in hate crimes the previous year. And there's always at least a dozen that why have been people, killed in the United why States. Why do people kill you? Why, why, why? I don't know. People have problems. People, <laughs> oh, boy. I mean, it is ridiculous. Anaya Parker in Los Angeles just two weeks ago was walking down the street and she was shot in the head. Mm. Because, and there is no reason for that. It, she wasn't hurting anybody. Have they caught some of the people who commit these crimes and questioned them? They catch some, but not all. Elon Nettles was killed say? in New what York a year say? ago and they haven't arrested anyone. I don't know what they say. Larry, I mean, there's going to be different circumstances for yeah, each exactly. case which led to it happening. You but, know? you know, it's that targeting anyone who's different, anybody who violates what they think a man or a woman should be or look like. And mm -hmm. that ultimately results in violence far too often. I think oftentimes, too, specifically with, you know, male violence against transgender women is that it challenges their sexuality and they're uneducated that it has nothing to do with their sexuality because they're seeing a, a transgender woman and they're like, I'm attracted to this person. Mm -hmm. And then they think that somehow conflicts with their identity. And it's like mental breakdown. Right. Are you optimistic? Of course. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm 34 years old, <laughs> but 14 year old me is still sitting here with you, Larry King. Right? <laughs> okay, so that blows my mind, you know, and that, that's coming a long way. Thank you all. Thank you very much. You. I'd like to thank my guests, Alex Newell, Nick Adams, and Laura Jane Grace. And remember, you can find me on Twitter at King's Things. Hope you learned a lot today. I'll see you next time.